Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome to another session. This uh, video is called 100% Predictable. I'm Andrew Shreve and you can read this teaching if you go online to my website, andrewshreve.org. Click on Partner Letters and go to March 2012 and you can read the teaching there, 100% Predictable. Hallelujah. Let's just pray and then we, we open the Word of God. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we recognize, Lord, that it is the anointing of your Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to minister your word and to understand truth, Lord, and to progress in the kingdom of God. And so we ask, Lord, for that anointing to be upon this video today, upon me and upon every listener, so that we can all grow in our understanding of your kingdom and ultimately see people set free and inherit eternal life. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to read along on this uh, teaching and then uh, uh, we'll read it and then we're going to make some comments on it as well. Hallelujah. So the delivery of God's supernatural power into our lives is 100% predictable when we understand the principles of God's kingdom and put into motion those principles. In other words, the, the so-called mystery of how to receive the power of God into our lives can be understood and experienced with predictable success. In other words, what I'm saying is that you can receive God's power, you can predictably receive God's power when you understand how the kingdom works. So a lot of people don't understand how the kingdom works or how the power, how the power comes. They think it's like hit or miss or something like that. Well, that's not actually true. And we're going to explain it in this video. God's people over the centuries have earnestly desired to receive God's power, but due to lack of knowledge, have often found it to be elusive. Subsequently, some leaders have rationalized in their minds reasons why they've not received God's power and developed inaccurate doctrines to support the impotence of their experience. Some of these doctrines include incorrectly understanding the sovereignty of God and teachings that suggest that God's will is unknowable. So, for example, there are some, maybe some spiritual leaders now or in the past, they, they tried to get God's power to work in their life but, or healing or something like that and it didn't, didn't happen. And so rather than just say they don't understand or rather than saying they were unable to get God's power, to receive God's power, they, bring, they make up doctrines or teachings that substantiate their experience. And two, two key teachings are the so-called sovereignty of God, which means that God can do whatever He wants. Um, and the other one is, is that uh, we don't know what the will of God is. You know, if it be thy will, O Lord. Both of these are incorrect, and we'll explain that. So in this teaching, I will outline some foundational principles which will assist us to have certainty concerning knowing God's will and dispel some incorrect myths about the sovereignty of God and illustrate how God's power can be predictably received into our lives. First, the inspiration of the Word of God, the Holy Bible. The first thing to understand about faith and receiving God's power is that faith must be absolute. All doubt must be removed. Okay, We can see an example of that in James chapter 1. And this is where a lot of modern theology is not absolute. It's like, this person says that, this person says that. We're not really sure, that sort of attitude. Well, that's not going to get any power of God happening in your life. In James chapter 1, it says this. If any of you lack wisdom, verse 5, Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So double-mindedness or uncertainty will cause us not to receive anything from the Lord. In other words, faith must be absolute. We must know what the will of God is. We must have certainty about the will of God. And, and that's how faith is exercised. So first you say, well, how do I know the will of God? Well, the source of faith is the Word of God. So we must 
No, in Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. So the Word of God brings faith, and God's Word is unchanging. It's God and His Word are unchanging, so therefore that's the source of our faith, something that does not change the Word of God. A belief, therefore, in the infallibility and divine inspiration of every single word in the Bible is necessary. So, you know, the Bible says that all scriptures God breathed or, or breathed by God, all scripture comes from the breath of God. And that's in Second Peter 3, verse 16, and then, sorry, Second Timothy 3, verse 16. Then Second Peter 1, 19 to 21 talks about we have a more sure word of prophecy, which is the scripture. Okay, so a literal and accurate translation of the original biblical Hebrew and Greek scripts is therefore also essential to eliminate doubt. You see, the Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek. So I, I, I don't read Hebrew and Greek. I mean, I've studied, studied it, but I don't really read it. I read English. So we need to make sure that we are using a translation which is an accurate representation of that Hebrew and Greek script, so this certainty is removed. Oh, sorry, un uncertainty is removed. So when it comes to exercising faith and receiving God's power, a liberal view of the inspiration of Scripture and loose paraphrased translations of the Bible create uncertainty and are therefore faith sapping and power stealing. You know, if, if you're reading a, a, a paraphrase, well, that's not a literal translation. That they're just some humans are saying, well, I think this is what it probably meant or whatever. It's not really exactly what the word means or what it's saying. For example, uh, there's a scripture that says in the Greek, it says we are justified through faith in his blood. Okay, so the Greek word there is blood, very clearly blood. But some translations say we are justified through faith in his sacrifice. It doesn't actually say sacrifice, it says blood. And we need to have faith in that blood. But they say, well, the blood means sacrifice. So they change the scripture. That's what we call a looser or a paraphrase of the, actual, of the actual scripture. That is not helpful in exercising faith. We need to get an accurate translation of the Bible. So I personally use the English King James Version translation of the Bible. And the reason is it's translated from the traditionally accepted Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. And there is some argument concerning manuscripts, but these are the traditionally accepted ones. It's a literal translation with italics indicating where translators have added words which were not found in the original language. And also, King James employed 57 of the best scholars at that time for a seven-year period to do the work. And so uh, I don't think your modern translations have that much uh, money poured into it, that many people working on a project. Um, I also use dictionaries for a deeper understanding of the key Hebrew and Greek words to assist my certainty and therefore my faith. So in other words, if I'm uncertain as to what the, 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 the English word is or want a deeper understanding, I can go to a dictionaries and get more a stronger interpretation of that potentially Greek or Hebrew word. And therefore, my faith is now fortified to put my faith in that word of God. Okay, next one. God will not change his written word. To be certain about God's will, we must be absolutely convinced that God will never change his written word will. See, we're talking here about receiving the power of God. And so to receive the power of God, we must first get certainty about what God's will is. That's why we're going to scripture. That's why we're now saying that God's not going to change what is written in the word of God. In other words, if God promises us something in the Bible, then he means it. And he will not reverse his promise or change his mind. The following scriptures declare that God does not lie and he will not change his word or break his covenant promises. And I've got a list there. You can go to the website and look at, look at that list of scriptures. We therefore need to place our absolute faith in the unchanging nature of God and his written promises. In other words, if you can find a promise of God, you know that God's not going to change that. Therefore, you can place your faith in it. God's written words, promises are God's will for our lives. So 
we also need to be confident that a written promise of God will always be God's will for our lives. In other words, we can't say one day, yes, that's God's will that I get healing. The next day, or maybe it's not God's will I get healing. Or yes, it's God's will that I prosper. Then the next day, no, it's not God's will that I prosper. So we need to eliminate these doubts. So one of the devil's strategies is to attack us with doubts about our worthiness to receive God's promises. This is where a biblical understanding of righteousness is essential. God's righteousness is gifted to us through faith in Jesus Christ. And I've listed some scriptures here in the book of Romans that tell us that righteousness is God's gift and we receive it through faith. Our righteousness is based on our being new creatures in Christ Jesus through the new birth. You can see that in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and verse 21, that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus and that he who had no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, in Christ we are made the righteousness of God. So as we maintain our faith in Jesus Christ, we continue to be the righteousness of God. And therefore we qualify for every promise of God because 2 Corinthians 1.20 says all the promises of God all the promises of God in Him, in Christ, are yes and amen. And so because we're in Christ, the, all the promises of God are yes and amen. So as long as we maintain our faith in Jesus Christ, we, are, we, main, we stay the righteousness of God because righteousness is by faith and therefore every promise is ours. So our righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ is the basis of our confidence that it will always remain God's will for us to receive His promises. Now let's talk about God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty does not mean that God has the right to change His written word or His will or lie to us. God's written word promise is the sovereign will of God. So the sovereign will of God means that God's, God's will is sovereign, absolute or independent. But the sovereign will of God does not mean that God in His sovereignty can tell lies. He can't tell lies. Or change what he's, ever, what he's already decreed is, as his will in his word. God in his sovereignty has chosen to commit himself to his written word. And it's God's integrity that will always commit his will to his written word. So we must be completely confident that God's written word is trustworthy and will never change. And that God is 100% committed to delivering his power so that his promises manifest in this world. You know, Hebrews um, chapter 1 verse 3 says something interesting. It says, um, upholding all things by the word of his power. So all things are upheld by the word of God's power. If God hasn't got the integrity to keep his word, then everything's gone anyway. So we must know that God is 100% committed to his word. Don't separate God and his word. Don't separate the sovereignty of God and His Word. You cannot. God's Word is His sovereign will. To suggest otherwise, to suggest that God is not 100% committed to delivering His power to His promises, is an attack against the integrity and reliability of God. And this is the work of the devil, to try and cast doubt upon God's Word. In, in Mark 4.15 it says, The devil cometh immediately to steal the Word that was sown in their heart. So God in His sovereignty has bound Himself to His written word. Very important. Okay. So, next. God will always honor faith in His promises with His power. Okay. If you have faith in God's word, God's promises, He will always honor that with His power. God is duty bound to respond with His power to faith in His word. The kingdom of God is a faith kingdom. An example of God's response to faith is seen through the many supernatural, powerful miracles of Jesus, which were attributed, not to Jesus, but to the faith of the person. And there's a lot of references there you can look at. In addition, we today, we're born again, we're justified, we're made righteous, we receive every promise of God through faith in His written word. And again, I've got a lot of references for that. God will always release His power into the area where faith in His Word is exercised and released. In other words, when God sees genuine faith in His Word, in His promises, and that faith is acted on, God will always release His power because He's duty-bound. Hallelujah. 
So faith in God's promises is increased through meditation of God's promises. Okay, so if the Word of God is dependable, God's will is dependable and knowable, faith will bring God's power, then we need to increase our faith. And that we do that through meditation. So we can control the level of our faith. As God's Word is the source of faith, we simply receive or plant and water God's Word into our heart to increase our faith. We must learn to take personal responsibility for the level of our faith. If our faith is too small to receive a particular promise of God, it is our responsibility to increase our faith to enable the receiving of that promise. In other words, you might uh, be trying to believe God for a healing and you're not getting success. Well, you don't just say, okay, well, if I didn't get success for the healing, then it's obviously not God's will that I get healed. No. If we don't have the faith to receive the healing from God, we are now, we have to take responsibility to increase our faith so we can receive the healing because we know that healing is God's will because it's in His promises, in His word. So we must bear the responsibility for the success of the manifestation of God's power into our lives. Okay? Mark 4.24 says, The measure we meet will be measured to us. The measure we put the word in will be the measure of God's kingdom or the measure of God's power that we receive. God is 100% faithful to release His power when faith in His promises is present in our hearts. The critical element is not a question over whether God is willing or faithful to deliver His power. The critical element is whether God's seed, His promise, has grown in our hearts to the level of producing enough faith to bear the fruit of what God's Word has promised. Jesus said, So is the kingdom, Mark 4, 26, as if a man will put seed into the ground. The element is, have we put the seed in the ground? Have we grown the seed? It's not whether it's God's will or not. Meditation of God's promises, or His Word, is the process of planting and watering the seed to cause the growth of the seed, which will produce the faith to receive the power. Joshua 1, 8, Psalm 1, 2 talks about meditation. Meditation means speak out loud, study and use our imagination to see ourselves in the possession of, of God's word or God's promise to us. If we can successfully grow the seeds of God's promises in our hearts, we are guaranteed to receive the power of God to fulfill His promises in our life. It is 100% predictable. So the emphasis is upon us and whether we can grow the seed or not. It's not, it's not a question over God's will. It's a question over have we successfully grown the seed. The parable of the sower in Mark 4, 1-29 teaches us that the seed of God's word will always produce the fruit of God's word if the seed can find the good heart to penetrate and grow in. The emphasis is not on the ability of the word to produce but on the ability of the human heart to successfully grow the seed. In other words, Jesus teaches we have responsibility to receive and grow his word into our hearts. If we are negligent concerning the growing of God's word or promises in our heart, we may not receive God's power. But if we are diligent and faithful to meditate and grow God's promises, His Word, in our hearts, God's seed is 100% predictable to produce the fulfillment of God's promises in our lives. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, thank You that You and Your eternal Word are dependable, reliable, predictable, faithful and true. Thank you that you will never change a written promise which is in your holy word. Thank you that it has been revealed to us that we have a responsibility to receive and grow your seed, your word, in our heart so that your seed will produce faith in our hearts. Thank you for the understanding that your kingdom is a faith kingdom. If we can successfully grow your promises in our hearts, you are duty bound to honor what you have promised. You are 100% predictable to manifest what you have promised into our lives. Thank you for the certain hope which we have that your word can greatly improve our life. Please strengthen us right now to meditate your word, to receive your word, your promises in our hearts, thereby receiving your supernatural power. We love and worship you, our Lord and Saviour. Hallelujah. Father, bless your people. 
with this teaching, Lord. Help them to take responsibility. Help them to understand. They take responsibility to receive your word. And Lord, we know that you are faithful to deliver your seed, your deliver your power, your fruit to the heart that is filled with faith and acts upon your word. We thank you, Father, for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Bless you. I love you. Bye.